Good evening, everybody. We are now recording. This is fun. Um, this is a good group of people, and tonight we're meeting with Carter Foster, who is a curator at the Whitney Museum of Art. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It's in New York. Um, Carter, welcome. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Nice Excellent. To you. Glad you're here with us. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you know, one of the ways that I really like to start this is to go back to the very beginning and have you share with us, like in two, three, four minutes, where you grew up, where you went to high school, where you went to college, when art began to enter the equation, and how you got from that humble beginning to where you are today. Uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I went to a public high school called Northside High School, which is, I think, no longer there. Um, I did get interested in art in high school, in art history. Um, I, I never actually wanted to be an artist, um, but I always liked history and art history and museums. I, I really li I like the idea of museums and working directly with art objects the way I envisioned them back then. I, I didn't really know what a curator did, but I, I knew they worked directly with art objects. So that's what I wanted to do from a pretty early age. <clears throat> um, and then when I went to college uh, at the University of Georgia in Athens, the first classes I took were in art history and I just liked it. I loved it. It was my favorite subject. And I just decided to pursue it then, um, and I pursued it in a very step-by-step -step way. Um, but I, I, my, the early exposure was really from, from teachers I had in high school that, that, um, that made me realize that um, certain things that, that I didn't necessarily think of as art were art, like paintings by Mondrian, which were, I proved challenging at that age. Um, but I was very intrigued by things like that. And, and so, um, you know, I just kept doing it. And then I got an art history degree uh, as an undergraduate and I got a graduate degree at Brown. And then I really, um, my career really started with internships in museums. My first uh, museum internship was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And that probably shaped me as much as anything because it was a great encyclopedic museum. And working in a print and drawing collection uh, that's as large as one like that uh, gives you a very broad, overview of the history of art from the Renaissance to now and I've always kept that and and see that as my um, my real um, interest is a kind of um, having an, un a, an understanding of a trajectory of art history that's longer than a hundred years. All kinds of questions arise. Did, what, there's an assumption that you went to art museums as a young as a, under 10 years old. Is that I so? Did, yeah. I did, that's true. I, my, actually, my best friend growing up as a child, his mother was the head of education at the High Museum of Art. So, and his um, family, unlike mine, his father was an architect. And so they had a house full of like modern furniture, like Saarinen and things like that. And they also collected African art. Um, and they just had a very different house than my house. Um, and so, and she was connected to the museum and she would take us there regularly. So I did go. Um, did your parents take you also, or did they? No, were, they were support. Parents did not. What was they, their attitude about your interest in art when they, you were, were teaching? They were. I mean, it didn't manifest itself so much when I was that young that I was, you know, begging to go to museums. Um, they, they, but they too were interested in art, and they couldn't afford to collect. But they had. My father was interested in certain types of um, cultural objects, let's say, like rugs, and um, and and they did have some paintings that were you know, more than just sort of um, decoration and, and, and they, but they didn't spend a great deal of money, but I think they, my dad in particular would seek out um, what he viewed as kind of, you know, European style paintings. And so we had some of those around the house. I mean, more than, more than just an average middle-class house, I think. Um, so there was an aesthetic sensibility that I, but both my parents had that wasn't manifest in terms of a, a sophisticated understanding of art history. Um, but I think they both did have um, an eye for beauty, as it were. I, I'll say that, yeah. Well, you know, that counts. That, 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 that's significant. Yeah, I uh, think it does. How did you find the University of Georgia? When did you graduate? I graduated in 1989. Um, it took me five years to graduate because I went to Paris for a year to study abroad because I wanted to learn French and I wanted to study European art. Um, but I, um, I love the University of Georgia. It was... Um, I had a difficult time in high school for various reasons, and I was not a good student. And then when I got to Georgia, I was a, I was a very studious, um, you know, I studied, a, I, I was interested in studying and learning, and um, very self-motivated at that point in my life. And I had great teachers. I had, I had wonderful teachers, a man named Robert Engus, who was a specialist in Italian Baroque art, um, a man named uh, Francois Auguste de Montecan, a very exotic guy who's like half Spanish, I think, and and they, they were tough teachers, too. I mean, it was not in, 
the courses were not easy. Um, uh, and I, and I, no, I, mean, I it's, it's something but, larger than a football school. I mean, uh, yeah. From, from, and I, you know, it was a school, like it was a big school and I, I it, but it, I think that in any large state school like that, where you have a lot of resources, if you're, especially if you're self-motivated to study, you can, you can get a, quite a good education. I certainly felt like I got a good education. I worked, I, I used to have a gallery for over 30 years and for quite a while I worked with Robert Stackhouse who did a residency at the University of Georgia for three years, I think. And I think, you know, I think they paid him in excess of $100,000 a year to be there and, you know, work in the studio uh -huh. and, and to be available. I mean, that, that's a really great program to have an artist be there in that kind of capacity. You know, and he made a large site-specific sculpture that I assume is still there. Well, um, they had a big active studio program, which we didn't, I didn't, there a lot of those, those students took art history classes, so there was some overlap there. Um, but I didn't, I was interested in older art at the time. I wasn't really studying any kind of contemporary art practice or theory. I, you know, in some ways I, and in some ways when I got to graduate school, I was a little behind in terms of theory. I, I wasn't up on sort of post-structuralist theory and the things that, concern a lot of contemporary curators now perhaps but um but i what i was well you just froze come back soon or is it me you there yeah i don't know what just happened that was yeah. really odd i'm okay. sorry here we go i don't know i don't know if that was you or me or everybody or what um I'm sorry, you were talking, we were segueing from theory and I'm not sure where you went with that. I was just saying that I was more, at the time I was more interested in older art history. So, um, so that's what I focused on. Um, and, and even though there were a lot of um, artists in the art history classes, I, wasn't, I was less engaged with sort of what you'd call contemporary art practice at that, at that time. All right, so let's explore how your affinities developed. I mean, how did you tell me the chronology? When did you? When did you start? I don't know. You went to Europe. You looked at Durer. Um, yeah, <laughs> a lot and, of French artists. Yeah, Italian artists. And, and um, Senefelder and yeah, I was also family always, hater. And I was also very interested always in 20th century art, especially sort of modernism, post, you know, Cubism, and in the development of European and American modernism. And then when I, I started working in museums, um, and I took classes in modern art when I went to graduate school, certainly. Um, but really when I got to, to the first great museum collection I worked with, which was the Philadelphia Museum, that's when I um, you know, started seeing like, the trajectory of art history from you know, older times to now, and how artists used art history to explore ideas always. And you, know, you can't really understand Picasso without understanding the history of European art that came before him. Um, and then Picasso, of course, leads on into more modern times. So I, you know, I, I working with a, 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 a print and drawing collection, which in, in big museums like that, are, they tend to be stored together. So you have access to all of it, um, which is something unique to, I think, the way print and drawing collections work and the way they're divided up curatorially. That, that really affected me to sort of want to see a, a larger range of art history, but always ending with modern and contemporary art because I don't, it doesn't stop and I never thought it stopped. Um, Do you feel like you worked from the present or a certain point backwards and forwards or a certain point backwards or you came from the past forwards? I, I mean, think I came from the past forward, yeah. Okay. Because I, I, I was interested in older art first. Um, How did you get interested in paper per se? I, um, the simple answer is I needed a, a job. It was after graduate school and I was looking for jobs or internships and I saw an internship advertised at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I had studied, broadly speaking, uh, pa European painting and sculpture. That, that was what I was interested in. Um, and, um, but drawing related to that, and I knew, to me, drawing was a part of that tradition. And I knew, you know, roughly what, how artists use drawing. So when I saw this internship, I, I, I told them right away that I would be interested in working with their drawing collection, which to, to me was just as good as, you know, working with painting or sculpture. I didn't differentiate. Um, qualitatively. And I had done, in graduate school, I had done work on drawings, specifically the drawings of Michelangelo and how they related to this, the Medici Chapel. And so I, you know, I, I was interested in how artists use drawings in history. And I knew that that was a, a real, a, a, an important thread in the history of art. So it, it felt natural, actually, even though it was also opportunistic and that I needed a job and I took it. What did, what did, what did you, what did you write your master's thesis on, etc.? 
Oh, uh, we had to, I, at, the, at that time at Brown, they had an exhibition related program and we, we did an exhibition about British portraiture in the 18th century that was sort of assigned to us. So instead of a master's thesis, we actually did this exhibition on, on British portraiture. So, so it wasn't really my choice. Um, but I kind of, I worked with a, um, and, so, and you didn't have to write a master's thesis. Um, I, but I worked with a man named Jürgen Schultz, who was a very um, uh, old fashioned kind of German trained, he was German, art historian. Um, and he was, I, I loved working with him because he was just very rigorous and, very, and traditional in a way, but also um, he knew about um, Italian Renaissance art, which was sort of a, something I really loved. And, and so I, I loved learning from him, although he was quite conservative in some ways. Did you different, differentiate, be, do you differentiate between paper, I mean, between drawing and printmaking? Yes, I do. Absolutely. I think they're very different things, actually. I, I would agree. Um, yeah. And why don't we talk about what you think the core issues are for each for a second? Um, very much related to technique and process in each one. I think drawing, I think drawing every, almost every artist draws, um, whether they're a graphic artist, whether they're an architect, whether they're a commercial artist, an illustrator, or a, a, fine, a so-called fine artist, for lack of a better word, uh, even a conceptual artist, almost every artist draws. Um, printmaking um, is often quite technique heavy in that you have to learn, the, there's many different techniques and you have to learn them and often specialize in not all of them, but one or two. And then its role in the history of art, I think is quite different than drawing in that it was the way, most significantly, it was the way images were disseminated before we had photography. And it was a, an extremely important this dissemination tool for spreading, you know, formal and um, visual ideas about the history of art, not just the history of art, but, but visual culture. So it played an incredibly important role in visual culture, pre-photography, and, and of course, post-photography too. And then I think, I think too, now the, the way that artists, when, when artists are attracted to printmaking, um, they're often, you know, it's because there's some, some part of the act conceptually that appeals to them, whether it's working with others or the fact that you have to check a print by proofing it and, and looking, there's a lot of back and forth. It's a, in some ways it's more complicated and, and less straightforward than, than just taking an instrument and drawing or something like that. So it, I think it both has a complicated history in terms of uh, the technique and, and a history, a complicated history in, in terms of its role in disseminating images and in art history. And, and in that sense is quite different than drawing. It's also, printmaking is also much more collaborative. It's, it's, yes, it's, it is more collaborative. That's something, that, uh, that's something uh, that's, I think, basic to it. Absolutely. I think so, too. And I think drawing is frequently insular, perhaps even more insular than painting, because it tends to be more private, because a fair amount of drawing isn't intended to go out into the world. It's intended right. to be informative about a more serious, that's in quotes, medium that comes along afterwards, the, a, a painting often um i also think that that something seminal to drawing is that it's often um at the beginning of the creative act and the creative process and that's part of um what makes it interesting to people um and and it's not always that way but i do think that frequently that's that in some ways that's one of the basic qualities of drawing is that an artist often starts an idea with a drawing um, i agree you know one of the things i've always enjoyed observing is that sculptors tend to draw really well that's absolutely true yes i agree um, and i'm not sure maybe because it's a better understanding of the third dimension that they're capable of translating into two dimensions and they don't do it any other time yeah i think something about it is you know because if they un they can they really can't imagine something in the round there's some they get that somehow on paper and it it, it does come out in just the visual qualities of what they draw um, <laughs> So yeah, that seems to be a constant in the history of art. But, Whether it's someone abstract like David Smith or Michelangelo who does, you know, uh, both of whom have done some of the best drawings ever, I, I would say. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you have a preference for drawing over printmaking. That's a question. Yes, I would say that, yes, it is. I mean, I love all art forms, but I, I, I definitely, I would say I prefer drawing um, just because I know more about it and I feel like I understand it better. Um, I can, you know, I feel like I know what artists are doing when they draw and what they're getting at. Whereas printmaking, it's a little bit more, there's a little more of a layer in between you and the object and, and there's often a, a technical component to understand. And print curators are often very, they get really into, you know, 
the different states and, and I knew that was coming. <laughs> all that stuff. And you know, that's great. It's just like not the, the same way I approach it or, or have the same, I don't have the same kind of minute interest in those kinds of things as much. Um, is your department set up though so that you are in the printmaking and drawing department or drawing and printmaking or they're distinct? Well, well what's, what's nice about the Whitney and it's different from other places I've worked is that, um, is that it's all one curatorial department. And actually I can do shows on anything. I don't, I don't have to just do shows on drawings. Uh, I can propose shows on paintings, uh, on artists who paint. I mean, it's, it's not very, I mean, we all have areas of expertise, but we all, but, but with that, and, and, and sometimes that comes with the medium specificity, but, but they don't really care, you know, so much um, what I work on. I, in other places where I've worked, I've been in, you know, a print, a works on paper department where the medium defined what I did more, um, more strictly. Um, so with the, but at the Whitney, that's really not the case. Yeah. Which leads me in two directions. So how many museums have you worked with? Uh, I worked at the Philadelphia, my first internship was at the National Gallery in Washington, the summer internship. Then I worked at the Philadelphia Museum. Then I worked at the New York Public Library, which has a, an important print collection. And I was actually called a print specialist there. So I worked in their print collection. Um, and and they have also an extensive collection of artist books. And then I worked at the Cleveland Museum, then I worked at LA County briefly for a year, and then I've been at the Whitney for almost 10 years now. So I've worked, was that five or six places? Yeah. I, 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 do, do you have, is there such a thing as tenure in these kinds of departments? No, no, absolutely not. They could fire me tomorrow. So when you left these other institutions where you were paid, as opposed to an internship where you were probably paid, but not respectfully. Right. Um, right. Were you, were the, the grass was greener and you chose to move on or? The, the yeah, and part of it was moving up the career ladder and just wanting to get a more senior job. Um, I, I, w I wanted to be back in New York when, when I um, started talking to the Whitney about a job. And so um, that was pretty um, an easy choice to make, even though I had just moved to Los Angeles. Um, it was exciting to work at a, at a major New York museum. And, and, and it is very different working at a New York museum, I think, than other, other places, because no matter where, how prominent the museum is, there's something about you know, just the coverage that you get at a, at a major museum in New York and the kind of attention that your projects receive is at a different level um, than, than other places. Um, that's just the reality. Yeah, well, the other places, many of them are no, not, not slouchy kinds of places. Not at all. And I, I loved working at the Cleveland Museum. That, I mean, that was really my first um, actual curatorial job and that I, I had the title of curator when I started, assistant curator. Um, but it was, um, it was a fantastic museum to work in and, and very different than what I do now because it's a, it's a museum that, first of all, covers like a long historical period. It covers, starts in, you know, ancient Greece and Rome or even earlier. Um, I didn't cover that, but, but you know, it's an it's encyclopedic museum, and it also is a wealthy museum and has money to buy, so a lot of my energies was focused on buying work for the collection um, and not, not fundraising, which, which is... Um, and at the Whitney, though, you, you're, the Whitney is a museum of American art, so you're, you're not correct. looking... So you've, you've had to set aside your interest in European art. Well, I, I, it's, it's always going to be there, but focus on it less, I would say, and learn more about America. Yeah, that's for sure. What about other cultures that are neither American nor European? Well, it's, um, we, you know, especially now when we live in this age where communication is, you know, the way it is, and, and I mean, in a way, borders are dissolving and c concepts of nationalities are merging. It's, you know, we try to be fluid with how we use the word American. And, you know, we almost joke, we joke internally that if you've had a cup of coffee in LaGuardia, you're American, you know, or you, you can be in the Whitney Collection. And or the biennial, it's true. Yeah, yeah, so we try to be inclusive, and, and, and it's something we grapple with a little bit in terms of definition because it, we don't want it to hamstring us. But it is a, it is an important part of our history. You know, it, it is what defines us in a lot in many ways. So, so you know, we try to walk that line. I mean, I think we're going to evolve as we as we move into this new building and as we, you know, go into the next move into the century more um you know, i think the world will change and our, our ideas about nationality will change and america is obviously becoming more and more of a, of a multicultural place so. yeah I, I agree um all right so let's the whitney's been in the news a lot this year um let's start chronologically with the biennial do you have a role in that i have no role in that whatsoever it's it's um the the curators are 
appointed and they do they come up with um with the artists and they come up with the installation with the artist and i i honestly have absolutely nothing to do with it if i if i'm not involved in a project like that i just don't have any i see it almost when the public sees it so. let's take some mundane questions for me that relate to the biennial but i i suppose yeah. that who how is it determined how many works of art are going to get installed in an exhibit it's up to it's up to the curators and the artists and um and the the um the limits of and or the uh abilities of the space itself so it's really you know it's pretty straightforward um usually biennials in my experience tend to be crammed pretty full i mean this biennial was crowded the one before it was much less crowded so that was an interesting i mean that was all purposeful for sure um so it really is up to the individual curators who are, are there are there are there frequently pieces that get added well i guess every installation the museum does a, mo a model and they make miniaturized reproductions of no, the not necessarily we work different ways and we don't have we actually don't have a super sophisticated system like that we i mean we do make we do use mo i use models when i when i install something but i um it was different in the broyer building because we knew that building really well now we're moving to another building so we're working more with models because we don't know the building so well but um a lot of us had experience working in that building for a long time so we, we sort of understood the spaces really well and had a good sense of where things would fit and not um, but it really, um, it really was up to the curators who were doing it, and and they certainly work with internal people at the Whitney because those are in that in in that by in the case of the last biennial they were outside curators who may have been less familiar with the building, but they always team them up with someone internal who knows. Interesting. And all right, so and now with the Jeff Koons exhibit, did yeah. you do you have a role in that? No, I had no role in that at all. I just heard about it while it was happening. And all right, and with the new building. That I do have a role in. Um, I don't. I don't have a role in, in so much with. I didn't have a role in 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 the building as it was being built and any kind of back and forth of the architects. But but I am one of four curators planning the inaugural display, and I have a so I have a deep role with what we're going to open with. Um, and we're going to open with permanent collection display from top to bottom. That'll be roughly chronological. Um, and we're we are planning that on models, and we're um, in the thick of it right now. Um, all right, so for an exhibit like that, do you tend to bring out the greatest hits or do you go to things that haven't been exhibited much? That is a very, very good question. And there, I would say there's even, um, I would say on, um, among the team of my colleagues that have been working on this for a couple of years, we certainly want to do both, but I would say the tendency has almost been more to bring out things we haven't shown, bring out works by that are surprises. We absolutely want to anchor the installation with, with icons, but but I, I think we, we're trying to be a little fearless and, and not be afraid to not show certain things if it means we're able to show certain other things that are that are more interest that are more of a surprise and that also hopefully rewrite history a little bit, you know, that shows some artists, privilege some artists that deserve recognition that they haven't gotten or, or or whatever. Now I don't know, you know, we're still debating and deciding on what's gonna be in it. But I, I think that we definitely feel like we want to mine our collection in a very deep way. I, I certainly feel that. And it's, and it's actually much more enjoyable and interesting to do that, I think, than to just trot out the same things everyone knows. Where, physically, is the collection? It's, um, we, we have storage facilities in Chelsea that are, that, are, um, that are where most of the collection is. And then some of the um, collection will be stored in the building. The works on paper will be stored uh, in the, study, the works on paper study center in the new building. And that's actually the majority of the collection. So do you go visit the, the actual actual works of art instead of looking at... Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We do both because it's easier to look at an image on the screen when you're at your office. But absolutely, we make regular visits to our storage facility to look at works. Is the decision-making democratic or does somebody have rank and they decide? People have rank, but it's um, but there's also, I think, a strong sense of consensus. And um, I mean, we have healthy debate. Um, I think we all respect each other's opinion, and and I think by and large we're, we're on the same page with a lot of broad issues. So you know we're happy to, um, but but so I would say I'd say we come to a consensus. You know that's what that's what we do. What departments are the four curators from? They're all from curatorial. We just have one curatorial department. There's there's nine, eight or nine curators at the Whitney. Oh, so you're not in a print and drawing department. No, no, we don't have that. It's just cure. It's just the curatorial department. We're very different than say MoMA or some that way. 
but people acknowledge each other's affinities or spe yes, and specialties yes. and expertise. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I mean, I'm an, I'm, I'm an expert in Edward Hopper from working at the Whitney and I did a show on his drawings, but I'm also an expert on his, on his work in general, I would say. And that's, you know, so if, if there's a Hopper question, people tend to defer to me. If there's a question about, you know, some other artist that somebody's done a show on, um, you know, there's certain, certainly some contemporary artists in the collection that I've worked with. So, um, you know, we all have variety of expertise. I tend to be more in the historical pre-war camp as opposed to sort of the, the, the right now contemporary, but, but um, you know, we all work with different aspects of the art we have. Interesting. Um, I remember a Hopper show at the Whitney that drew on early illustrations that perhaps did a disservice to the uh, overall Hopper over. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Do you recall? I, I didn't. I, just, I wasn't around when. I know that's why the question is safe. It was a while, <laughs> a while back. Um, well, Hopper. I'll just let Hopper speak for himself. Hopper hated illustrating. He did it for to make a living, and he himself didn't like doing it. So I think that says a lot, actually. So maybe it shouldn't have been shown. There's this show now at the Norman Rockwell Museum. I just saw it on his illustrations. So he was a thing about. He was a good illustrator, I think. But he was, you know, he didn't consider himself an illustrator. He he considered himself a painter. He's and a better a, artist than an illustrator. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, well, I, I would agree. All right, here's another touchy subject. I, I find that quite a few curators have a point of view and are trying to do an exhibit as illustration, wrong word, of a theory and are prone to putting artists and or the artwork into a context that neither the artist wants or many others feel the art deserves. Um, do you know what I, can you say? I do know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean, yeah. Okay, I so I, in that case, I said it well enough. <laughs> um, that irks me. Do, uh -huh. you, do you have an opinion? Uh, well, I, I mean, I- You're, you're I free to think, disagree with me. I like, for, I don't disagree with you. I like for, I like, but, and I myself don't work that way. I don't, and I'm, but I'm not, um, I, I like to go where the artists lead me and, and I, and I don't do many thematic shows in the contemporary art field, which is what you're talking about. I think, you know, essentially people have, um, they do follow a, a you know, kind of, they, they have come up with a thematic concept and, and find work that fits it. Um, I, I tend not to work that way. Um, partly because I've worked, um, with older art mostly. Um, and I've tended to do monographic shows when I do work with contemporary artists. So you can avoid that issue altogether. Um, but I do think, you know, it's interesting. I've seen the rise of this idea of curating since I've been an art. I, and I consider myself an art historian who works as a curator, but that's, okay. I, I would say that's what I am more than it. Um, but now we've, we've come to this moment where there is this, the, the word curating is thrown around as a, as a verb and a, and an activity in a way it never was, you know, when I started studying art history. Um, and, and, and I think we've gotten away from the, 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 you know, the root meaning of curating is caretaking. Um, and I started working in, as a curator because I wanted to take care of the art that was in museums where I wanted to work. Um, now curating is, in, in the contemporary sense, it means, you know, putting together things in a certain way, um, whether it's a, an outfit, a, you know, a collection of books or whatever. People use the term curating to refer to that sort of activity, and that's sort of a new thing, and I, I'm not so into it either. Um, what do you, it, how do you feel about artists? It. I'm sorry, how do you feel about artists curating? I think it's great, that's fine. Um, I think they do some of the more interesting things, actually. How do you feel about artists curating themselves into exhibits? Um, but I mean, that's up to them. They have to, you know, that's a, obviously they're setting themselves up for possible criticism if they do that, but that's, that's sort of up to them. Yeah, I, I would be critical of that. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think people are writing some, you know, ch there's a chat window and I'm seeing people asking good questions and we'll open it up in a moment to, um, to those questions. Um, how far ahead are you working on exhibits? Uh, you know, it depends. Um, in the old Whitney, we worked, sometimes we would put together exhibitions relatively quickly if they were lobby gallery shows dealing with contemporary artists. Um, but if you're working on a, I, I worked on the Edward Hopper drawing show for three years, um, so or, or even a little more in terms of the research time. 
Um, if you're working on a, a show that, that requires, you know, long lead time with loans from other institutions, uh, you have to work sort of two to five years out. Um, if you're doing a contemporary art project with a living artist who has a, you know, an active studio practice, you can work much more quickly. So we do a bit of both. I mean, I, I tend to work further, further out. I would say the average is about three years. Um, Who's in charge of arranging the loans? Is that your responsibility when you're uh, looking? It's done through our, it's done through our, um, I mean, our registrar. Once we, we, we get the initial um, official requests out as curators, you kind of compose uh, a well-argued letter if it's a difficult loan to get, you know, if you're borrowing a major work from a major museum, like we got Nighthawks for my, the Hopper show, that was a, you know, that was a negotiation um, some, for something like that. So, so for certain loans, you have to really negotiate in person even. Um, but once all that's, once the, the loan is agreed upon, all the shipping is, and arranging and insurance is done by the registrar. Is there sometimes a fee involved in borrowing work? You, usually museums charge a nominal administrative fee, but, but since we all have to borrow from each other to do these shows, we, you know, we don't, we're not making money from stuff. We're not trying to make money from our, our peer institutions because we're all, we're peers. So we have to, we want to borrow from Chicago or LACMA or the Nighthawk well, comes from the Art Institute in Chicago. How does that travel? By plane or by? It travels by, by, by if it's a domestic loan like that, it travels by, by truck. Right. And yeah. it's a secure okay air ride truck yeah climate controlled truck with a courier and uh, ample security <laughs> yes and typically so think about all, any truck you see might be have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of art on it you never know i, I yeah i know there was a painting a, a painting was stolen by from the toledo museum while it was being transported to a show in new york a few years ago it was a good story there's a friend of mine who we could do a webinar with who had his whole truck of uh, every, all the contents were stolen. Everything. Oh, horrible. You know, a Lichtenstein painting was in there, a whole bunch oh, of Oh, my stuff. God. Oh, uh, this was in the, like, early 80s or something. Yeah, right. um, and he, he managed to stay in business. Well, we um, split shipments, you know, too. Yeah, sort of like mom and dad who travel on different airplanes. But uh, if they travel overseas, they travel on airplanes, for sure. But usually, always with a courier, you know, yeah. All right, so before we open this up for questions, let's talk a moment about how artists get on your radar. How do you, how do you find newness? Uh, in the same way as many people find, I would say the, the number one way is, you know, a network of people in the art world, for lack of a better term, and, and just, you know, keeping eyes and ears open and listening to people um, whose opinion I respect. Um, but also, I'm, I mean, I try to go out to and, and view galleries and museum exhibitions as much as possible as time allows. Um, you know, that, that waxes and wanes with the busyness of my work schedule. It's been hard with the opening of the new building because it's been, that's been really the focus. But um, I try to go to galleries as much as I can, and I try to go to artist studios as much as I can, as time permits. And, um, and beyond that, it's, and, and museum exhibitions, to be sure. And beyond that, it's really um, talking to other artists and other, um, you know, peers in the art world. When you do studio visits, are you predominantly looking at drawing, or are you... No. No, any artist that might be of interest, really. Um, and, and and is it with an exhibit in mind, or is it with just these days being it, turned it, on? It's either it's either I'm considering acquiring their work, in which case it would be probably an artist who makes drawings, but it may not be the the, the only thing they make. Um, or it's that you know have an exhibition idea, or sometimes it's just if it's a if it's a artist whose work I'm interested in, you know, I just do a studio visit because I have that. Luxury. I mean, they ha they'll actually say yes usually. Um, so, um, so, so, but usually, I try to do it with a purpose, and you know, usually, usually acquisition. I would say is the number one reason, considering the work for acquisition. Art fairs. Do you, what do you do? With, how do you, I I go to them. I don't I don't enjoy them. I don't find them optimal places for viewing, but but I go to them. You know, certainly they're just part of the world we live in now. What are you going to do? Do you, you acquire to, at art fairs, or are you thinking about? We, it's, you know, what's good about them is it's an efficient way to look at lots of work. You know, it's an, you can see lots of things quickly. That's the best thing about it. Um, so, but not so much because we have a sort of a process for acquisition that takes some time. We can't just like buy stuff off the walls. We don't really have money in hand. I have occasionally, I have, I think one time bought something out of an art fair where I raised the money from a group of donors that was in Miami. It was in Miami and, and we bought the work, but that doesn't happen very often. All right, let's let's field some questions. Um, I don't. I saw Chris had a good question. I don't remember. A lot of you guys had good questions as we've been going. I hope you remember them. Um, 
Chris, do you remember your question? Um, I think you answered a lot of them already (laughs) (laughs) from what Paul had just said. But, um, yeah, how many studio visits would you say you do like in a month or a year? Uh, More like a year. um, Probably like once a month I do one. You know, it depends. Like when I first got to the Whitney, I was doing more because I had more time to do them. And as it's been less lately just because of the the build up to the to the um to the new building but i expect after we open i'll have time to do more and i i really i genuinely enjoy doing them um so um so i you know when when i have more time i do like maybe more like two or three a month mm. and then i do i also do um studio visits at at residency programs like i regularly uh, smack melon i do um there's a few residency programs that that often invite me and i try to do that because i really enjoy that as well what do you do on vacation what, you know, where do you go on vacation and what do you, do you look at art on vacation i love to look at art i love to go i love um i love europe and i love to go, go to european museums and look at i love italy um so that's uh, you know I, I and i don't consider going to museums work i always love to go to museums i've never been to and so um, and cities I've never been to. Um, I, I did sort of satisfy a lot of my itch to go to Europe. I mean, I've been to probably most places I've wanted to go in Europe. Not every place, certainly, but, but a lot of places. So now I, I, when I travel, I love to travel, and I, I, I like to go to, you know, exotic places if I can afford it and find the time. Um, and th- so that's, like, I went to Syria four years ago before the trouble started. It was the, one of the most incredible trips I've ever taken. So I, I love doing stuff like that. But I always, I almost always go look at art, no matter what I'm doing. Um, Sandy, I wanted to, you asked a question about regionalism, kind of. Go ahead and ask it. Yeah, I just wanted to know if his studio visits were always to New York artists. No, they're not. I mean, I, I try to do studio visits um, if I'm in a city and have, you know, uh, know of an artist that I want to go see. Um, obviously, Los Angeles is a big place for artists working now. So that would be probably the number two place that I've done studio visits. But um, I've done them in Houston. I've done them in Chicago. Um, usually I, they're, they're, I just try to do them when I'm, you know, when I'm in a city already and mm-hmm. um, find an artist. That, that for whatever reason, there's an artist I want to go see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Sure. Sherry wants us to ask Barbara, Barbara's question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love how people keep it. Like, I want to hear her question. All right, Barbara, <laughs> take it away. I just wanted to know if you thought digital has really impacted drawing. Uh, did, whether I, I couldn't totally hear you. Whether, yeah, whether digital digital media has impacted drawing. Well, I think in a way it's like a new form of drawing, perhaps. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, it's um, it, it's a, it's interesting. I I was speaking. I was on a panel with the painter and and digital artist Amy Silman, and she was talking about. Um, you know, she's, she's someone who likes technology, but she also loves to draw and loves to paint in a very, you know, with traditional materials. And she, and she was, she, she's made some digital films and she was talking about how, you know, she, she will use like iPad applications to draw, but it's ne- she doesn't, it's never going to be the same thing because drawing has a resistance. You know, when you, when you put an instrument right. against the paper, there's a physical resistance that you don't get with the digital. So she was sort of making a claim that they're, you know, very different kinds of acts. I, I don't know as much about, you know, digital technology as, as somebody who's, you know, really well versed in it. Um, but I do think, it, it, you know, the, the, the look of things is so influenced by computer screens now that inevitably it's going to turn up in, in, in drawing. But often people just translate that into with a drawing media. So, and, and let that be, and that can, that can end up being very beautiful, I, I think so. But, but certainly I think it's going to have an impact. Thank you. Yeah. Theo had a question about the biennial. Um, let me unmute her. There you go, Theo. Go ahead. Hi there. Hi. I was uh, I was interested in who in the Whitney selected the curators for the last biennial. I believe that was the dep- the deputy director Donna DeSalvo. That's probably the person who was ultimately responsible, but they, they also had, um, I think that the curators of the previous biennial were involved and there was probably some input from other curators on staff um, as, as far as I know it, yeah. So it's, it's selected by the, the top level administration, I can say in the most broad way. 
Does it uh, at all affect you that the last two biennials have received so much varied criticism from so many uh, different uh, elements uh, and people within the art world? It doesn't affect, I mean, it, it certainly affects me. Um, I mean, the biennial as a sort of entity has always been this controversial, you know, I mean, it's, it, it had a, um, you know, I remember, I, re I remember I went to the 1993 biennial. I was, I was in graduate school at the time. And, you know, that was this incredibly controversial biennial when it came out. And now it's kind of lauded as this land, land, landmark moment. Um, and I think that the, the biennial always has courted controversy, so we're never surprised um, uh, when, when it happens. I mean, I think we were a little taken aback with the, the whole Yams Collective thing and then withdrawing, and that was a little bit, um, you know, that was hard in some ways. That was very hard. I mean, there was a lot, believe me, there's, when that happens, there's institutional soul searching that goes on, um, you know. So, um, we, we, believe me, that criticism is, is um, you know, we listen. To, it's, I don't want to, what do I want to say? We just... It affects us. It certainly affects us. Yeah, it certainly affects the it, it affects the um, the atmosphere of, of of you know the the interior. What's going on there for sure? My last question would be, and maybe you don't have the answer yet, but you said you were going to draw heavily on the permanent collection when you open the new Whitney. Not not uh, not heavily entirely. It's only going to be permanent. Entirely. Yeah. Will that include um, paintings that you're holding in the collection? Abstract paintings. Yes, it definitely will. Yes. No Thank fun. you. Yes, you're welcome. I look forward to it. Yeah, good. We look forward to having you. To what extent do you try to be, I don't like the phrase, but to what extent do you try to be politically correct? I mean, obviously women are underrepresented yes. in art museums. Well, and I would say the number one discussion we've had, at, at this, this group of curators that's working on the opening display the number one discussion we've had throughout the entire time we've worked on it is how can we increase diversity? How can we get more uh, African-American artists, women artists, artists of color, Hispanic, Latino, Chicano? I mean, we really have thought and in some cases acted in terms of acquisitions. We've made some acquisitions of, of works by some artists that we didn't have that, 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 that you know, fill those gaps. I mean, that said, it's very difficult in the pre-war period because we just, the collection doesn't support um, the amount of diversity, especially with, with, especially with artists of color, I would say, uh, in the pre-war period. We actually probably have more work by women um, in the pre-war period. As, as you get into the contemporary, it, it has become more of the conversation as it has, you know, but it's, um, we, we've thought about it quite a bit. And in some cases, I think, I mean, we have some artists that we, we supported significantly that, that we've never shown since. And, and, and so I think we have to, um, I feel strongly that we have to bone up and show those artists. Um, I'm thinking particularly of a sculptor named Richmond Barte, an African-American Harlem Renaissance figure that we own major work by, and we've, we haven't shown it much. And I, it became a particular interest of mine and I, as I researched this artist and, and sort of wanted to champion him for the collection. So, you know, there's been moments like that throughout our working. Um, I would think so. To what extent is diversity related to who you want your audience to be? Um, I, I mean, don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I think, I don't think we put, we try to have a diversity of artists because we want to, well, I don't know. How do I say that? I think we want the, we feel like the achievements of these artists needs to be represented and has been overlooked. And we want, to, we want to get it into the narrative. And then we feel that that's really, we th I think we feel like it's, what's important is to get it into the narrative of our history that's been excluded, that has excluded it previously. And I think we think about that number one. Certainly, we hope that brings wider audience, but I don't know that that's, I think, I would think that getting into the narrative of our history is the number one concern, I would say. Okay. Um, Paul, let's go to your question, and then I think we'll go to, I don't know, wait a minute. Well, I'll, I'll find Paul, and I'll think about who it was. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I was wondering if you, um, if there are any new movements that you've noticed coming down the pike, you know, or rising? Or... Say that again, sorry. Any new movements, you know, like similar types of work coming, you know, that might be considered a movement. Well, I think the use of social media and Instagram is becoming something. That's, I mean, like the use, the stream of, I would think the, the streaming of images and the ability to do that is might, you know, is going to turn into 
a tool that artists use, and I think we're in a moment where that's still gelling, it, it would seem to me. I don't know if that's a movement, but I think that, that the way that that kind of technology is affecting the way people put together images. I mean, I don't know about you, but I follow certain artists on Instagram and they sort of treat it like a project. And it's interesting. I think it's quite interesting. Thank you. Sam, let's go to you. You have a few questions. Pick one or two. Um, go ahead, Sam. Um, yeah. Um, when you were talking about um, how to relate your permanent collection with the diversity of a more contemporary art um, collection of artists, I wonder if there could be a possibility that um, if there's less diversity in your permanent collection, could you juxtapose that with the diversity of contemporary art collection? Well, we, we talk about ways to do that. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little hard to, when you um, compare something made in 1990, say, and something made in 1910, it's such a strong statement to put two things like that together that are so far apart historically that it's, um, you know, it's, I, it's tricky to do curatorially. Um, so, but we certainly um, try and, you know, make cogent comparisons early on, including, you know, getting some of these artists that are underrepresented out, out with the sort of big, bigger yeah. names. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Kim, it's I'm an, coming to you. It's been interesting to, to it's been an interesting issue to deal with. It really has, as we, you know. Yeah, because you could you could tie them visually. You know, you could look yeah. at you, you know the the juxtaposition pictorially, or you could look at them conceptually, and and yeah, you would have to really probe to find a thread there, maybe in the content. I mean, I I don't think we're going to do that so much with this inaugural display because we're trying to, in the end, let a chronology ground. The, the history that we're telling because we just feel like we had, that's probably the best thing to do at this point. But I think in the future, yeah. we, I mean, you know, certainly we'll, we, you know, that can be done more in, with the collection in the future, with no question. I, and I love it. I actually think it's, you know, artists get ideas from each other, whether they're alive or dead. And, you know, to, to um, you know, get a contemporary artist's take on an earlier type of work, um, whatever the, you know, the, the situation of its making is, is incredibly interesting often. Yeah, and I have another question. I'm, I'm just sort of, um, I'm not on Instagram. I just, I just started Instagram today, actually, uh -huh. and I, I don't really <laughs> know anything uh -huh. about it. But it does seem so easy, you know. So there's, there's, there, you're not able to quite catch the depth. Um, you know, it's not there long enough. There's something about the time that it's up, and you got to be there at the moment. Right. And, well, yeah. that's true, but I think what artists will do will take that as a given and do something, you know, just just yeah. just play with that. Yeah. 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 So. Thanks, Sam. Kim, your turn. Yeah, hi. Hi. I have, hi. I have a question about um, the distinction and how, what kind of distinction you make between sketches uh, and finished pieces, finished drawings. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure, you, yeah, there are these distinctions. And I'm wondering how those distinctions have changed or whether there have been times when you thought something was actually a sketch for something, but then you really, uh, at another point, have changed your mind and said, no, this is really the artist intended a finished, finished piece here. That's an interesting, no, that's a, it's a good question. And it's, um, I mean, I've dealt with that a lot as a historian of the history of drawing in some degrees and to understand the categories artists have used for drawing. So whether, you know, it's, it's a little more, if you're dealing with um, sort of so-called old masters, um, usually it's a, a pretty careful progression from very sketchy, somewhat formless, uh, overall trying to work out a compositional idea to a more detailed kind of study of, of a hand or a still life or whatever the subject is developing as. Um, so you kind of go from a macro to a micro, um, and the, and the, and you can categorize the drawings accordingly. Um, the, the term sketch, I, I use the, the, I use the term more just preparatory study. A sketch is kind of a, a, a more of a casual term that we don't use as much, although it's, it's used a lot in popular culture. Um, it does sort of imply something quickly, quickly and rapidly done, but that's true of a lot of drawings that even aren't sketches, um, I would say. So I think that there's like... I mean, artists, although artists who draw 
tend to, you know, they're, they're still using the same materials by and large that they've always used, chalk, charcoal, pencil, graph, you know, graphite. Um, and so that, that gives you only so, a, a set of parameters and they tend to work within those parameters. So they're fairly easy to categorize in that sense. I think what's interesting is to conceptually understand how an artist is using drawings how what those categories actually mean to that artist and why one artist might emphasize one of those categories more than another. I mean, I was fascinated working on Edward Hopper about whom I knew nothing before I worked at the Whitney. Look, and, and I had the, the great, um, you know, luck to be able to work with a huge cache of his drawings that were not really well known. And he, you know, the, the range of ways he treated the drawing medium from the most simple one or two lines on a sheet of paper that actually meant something to him and, and connected to a, a painting that you could discern, you get that level of simplicity versus a completely finished, virtuoso, amazing rendering of a fully formed face with light and shade and, you know, subtle um, falling of light across the face. I mean, that, that, the, that range is interesting and, and to understand an artist using the variety of that range is a, is a great pleasure as an art historian. I, I love doing that, yeah. Right, right. Hope that thank answered you. your question, sorry. Very, yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Cool, uh, Melissa, you are unmuted, go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here. Sure. Um, I, I draw a lot, and I, but I don't generally show them uh, unless I'm showing some kind of quick thing on, on Facebook or something that uh -huh. I'm working on. And, uh, but the other part, there's like a step between the sketch and the sculpture where I'm designing with paper construction. And I wonder if you study those kinds of sketches and um, do you like to see those on a studio visit? I, I always like to see anything related to process and technique. And I'm, always, I'm just fascinated by technique and materials that artists use. That, that, that's always what interests me the most. Um, I guess that's mm -hmm. partly because that's what interests me the most as an art historian when you're able to look at those materials and, and come to some understanding about the artist's creative thought that you didn't have before. I think those things are very revelatory about creative thought and that's why I like them. And, and I think that, you know, drawing is a great thing to use in a, in a broad sense. Um, you can draw in three dimensions. Many people would say that, you know, so-called the tradition of, you know, making a bozzetto in sculpture and clay, that's a kind of three-dimensional drawing um, that, that is yeah. also um, just, just like drawing on paper, it's just in, in three dimensions, but it's the same, it has many of the same qualities. Um, and, and so, yeah I, yeah, I love to see that kind of stuff. And I love to see how artists, you know, come up with their own thing that works for them to get to whatever they're trying to do eventually. Uh -huh. Great. And I would say that's part of the drawing, ad, the act of drawing and, and drawing in the, in the broadest sense. Yeah, when, I, when I'm drawing with, I can't really get to what I need to with just paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. I can't really visualize it all the time. I can, I could for many mediums, but not with the steel I'm working with. So it, the paper kind of acts like the steel. So I have to actually get in there and keep adjusting my pattern as I go. Yeah, so. yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Sarah Lynch, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay, there. Hi. Oh, so a previous person who spoke like a couple of weeks ago mentioned that they really didn't like to see artists' works in progress because it made them like want to tell the artist how they should finish the work and then, but they wouldn't, they'd hold back and then the artist would finish it a different way and then they wouldn't like the final piece. It's never, you know what, it's never up to me. I'm not an artist and it's not up to me to tell an art to, I would never think of telling an artist I'm never frustrated because I want to tell the artist how to finish a work. I'm not an artist. It's they're the artist. I want yeah, to understand what they're trying to do. And I, that to me is like, I, so I would never have that problem. <laughs> yeah, it's how they say that, but they implied like their head would like make that jump. And I was just wondering. Yeah. My I know. head doesn't make that jump because I, I, I want the artist to show me where to go. I feel like, you know, okay. they know something. They can do something I can't do. I'm not an artist. Um, but, you know, but I do feel like I understand some of the things they struggle with. But I feel the great, you know, it's a great privilege to be in someone's studio and see how they work. I feel like a, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm a guest in that sense. And, you know, I feel very strongly about that. Okay. Yeah, because I was just, it made me really stop and think because I and a lot of the artists I follow on Instagram or Facebook, they constantly share. And there's now, yeah. like with that technology, there's yeah. this crazy record of how yeah. a piece yeah. is built. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's up to you. Not every artist has to be comfortable doing that, and they shouldn't do it if they're not comfortable with it. But if you like yeah. to do it, there's no reason not to. Okay. 
Sure. You know, people, you. people, people like to know about studio visits, and nobody's asked that question per se that I've noticed. Um, how long do studio visits last? What do you want the artist to share with you, not share with you? Do you want to be able to look without having to talk? Is it a lot of a discussion? What, what I like, I like. It's like anything. Sometimes you have a great dialogue and a great rapport with so it, the best ones are when you have a great rapport. You 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 understand the work and love the work, and you have a great rapport and a great conversation. That that doesn't happen every time. Um, generally, the, the I mean, generally they last an hour. I usually give about an hour, depending on unless there's some specific thing we're trying to. We have business beyond the studio visit, but usually if it's an artist that I, I'm just. Um, doing a studio visit with her the first time, I think an hour seems like a good amount of time. Um, I, I, it's good when they're prepared to, to keep showing me work, even if it's on a computer screen. Uh, it's, it's, I think the, the, the ones that become awkward are when you don't have enough work to look at for whatever reason. And, and, and um, so I think it's good when the artist is, is absolutely prepared with more work to show you and, and hopefully can, can you know verbalize in some way what their main interests are as an artist um beyond that i try usually then it just takes off into a dialogue um somehow and um but i yeah that's so so that's how i kind of do it how much older work do you want them to have out when you walk in um I, that's sort of up to them but often that's a really good um um it's it's you know it's helpful because it helps you understand what the current work is about. So it's fine to have as much uh, as possible, yeah. And I can, I, I'm, I can look really quickly. So I think that one of the mistakes some artists make is they think I wanna look at one thing for 10 minutes. I, I can look at one thing. I'm a pretty quick study. I mean, I do look at art every, all the time, every day. So, um, so I like, a, I like a, a lot of material to look at. Cool. Yeah. Hang on, your turn, go ahead. Oh, hi. Kai hi. Clark, thank you for talking with us. Sure. Um, I'm a pastel artist, and I was just wondering, do you consider that a drawing or a painting? I consider it a drawing, but historically it's been also put in with painting. And in many American museums, pastels are in the painting department. So it's a little bit of a hybrid, but um, it tends to be stored historically in museums in drawing departments because it has those conservation needs. You know, it's, it's friable media. Mm -hmm. But I personally consider it a drawing, but it, it definitely has this, it has a hybrid aspect to it in the history of art, I would say. It's a wonderful medium, though. I love pastel. Yeah, I do too. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. I think I've run out of people with questions. All right. Um, I'm just trying to scan through here, and I don't oh, know. Oh, this is Jim Klein. I have a question. Please go ahead, Jim. Uh, yes. Um, a hundred years from now, how would you, uh, what would you think the bias would be from oil versus acrylic paintings? And then also in your archives, how old is your oldest acrylic and how are the acrylics uh, holding up uh, after uh, a lot of years of storage? I think it was an interesting question. I mean, I actually did a show at the Whitney called Synthetic um, and it started out as a show called, in my head, as a show called The Acrylic Moment. And it was, you know, sort of about the rise of acrylic paint in the six in the 60s and, and this moment of abstraction and acrylic and this the particular look of that kind of paint so i think that you know i think that artists that have used that medium well they will they will continue to be well regarded um and i don't know what the oldest acrylic work in our collection is i'd have to that'd be something i'd have to check it'd, it'd be hard for me to answer that um but you know, when does acrylic, is it, it, it's invented in the, in the late 50s, early 60s? No, now? in the 20s. Acrylic paint was oh, invented for the okay. Mexican muralists. All right. So there and you go. ultimately, that's not what they use. They shifted right. to a lead-based paint. But right. that's why it was created. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. And are they holding up well? Uh, they are holding up well, yes. I, and I, I, you know, I think it's a, I love it. And, and they definitely are holding up well, I would say. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. But it's, um, you know, it's a very different medium than oil. For sure. Uh, how about, I, I hate to end with such a loaded question, um, Giclés. Mm. Yeah, I don't even know. I mean, I, I think unless you're doing it in a very clear and st strongly conceptual way, you one has to be careful about just making a reproduction of a work in another medium that doesn't have its own inherent, you know, reason for being, you know, if you're just, and I don't know what, I, I, I feel like 
when I see G clays that are just used because someone's reproducing a painting they made and want to want another way to sell an image, I mean that's fine if you want to do that. It's gonna, but that's not. It's it's hard for me as a curator to consider that an original work of art unless there's some conceptual trope behind it that is part of the concept. Just that, if that makes sense. It does indeed. Um, a number of people are asking questions about yeah, and Chris Chris just pulled it up. Um, people working in divergent media like house paint or yeah. latex, like yeah. Jackson Pollock and others. Oh yeah, and or oh, who am I blanking on? Who's the wonderful female artist who died too young in the fifties who worked with latex? Uh, oh, I don't. Oh, oh Eva Hesse. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Good catch. Um, all right. So, what about people who work in media that isn't going to last? Our job as a museum and as curators, we work with with conservators. Our job is to preserve the works in our care and to care for them and to find ways to make them last so that we can show them in the future. And sometimes we there's less we can do, and sometimes there's more we can do. But it's our job to do that. And it's the the artists um, when they're alive can help us understand how they worked. But it's our job not to tell them how to work, but to understand how they work so that we can preserve it in the best way possible that is true to their original vision. And we try and do that. I can honestly say we try and do that. We have an amazing conservator at the Whitney named Carol Mancusiangaro, who's pioneer in this field. And she, you know, um, she, she, I just stated, I think, what, her, what she would say if someone asked her. Wonderful. Carter, I think we're all set. I think we're Great. done. I think you've been fabulous. This has been like, you know, it's, it's, this has been a lot of questions with a, a lot of information shared. Um, let me unmute everybody so we can all say thank you. I really appreciate you being with us this evening and sharing so much. Thank you very much. Thank Everybody's you. Thank 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 you.